Matt Berry is the CEO and chairman of Freelancer.com. It's the world's leading freelancing and crowdsourcing marketplace. It's a public company listed on the ASX since November of 2013. Matt is an award-winning entrepreneur, technologist, and lecturer, and one of the most influential Australians in IT. What I hope to do in this talk is kind of show you kind of the steps along the way, really literally from when you start off with one person in the room, kind of what I did next, when I had two people in the room, what I did next, and so forth, right through to today. I run a company called France Unlimited. It's, um, we run a bunch of companies. One is uh, France.com, which is the world's largest uh, online financing and crowdsourcing marketplace. You can think of it just like eBay. Uh, you can go there to hire people to do any sort of job you can possibly think of. Or if you want to do a job, you can jump in, you can, you can work in any field. We have, uh, about, as of this morning, 19 million people on the site. Uh, about 9 million jobs have been uh, performed. And you can go there to get anything done, such as build a website, design a logo, right through to really complicated things, such as astrophysics, aerospace engineering, genetic engineering, biotechnology, and so forth. Um, so uh, and today it's publicly listed, and uh, the market capitalization is around $800 million. So you know, I'll take you literally from you know, one person in the room right through to the end, and hopefully along the way, no matter where you are with your business, you might go, hang on, that's kind of where I am. These are the sorts of problems he, he faced at that point. And, you know, here's maybe what he did. You know, you can see what I did next, and maybe it, maybe it'll help you, help you in your business and how you think about things. The genesis of freelancer is, I was uh, helping out uh, my mother actually, uh, who runs a uh, online business. It's basically it's a, a wholesale business. She sells. So what I did was I redid the website for her, and um, you know, got got it got it looking a little bit more fresh. And then what I needed to do was I needed to, um, I thought I'd set up a little online directory. And this online directory was basically a directory of all the shops that um, uh, she supplied with the theory that you know, other people who didn't uh, buy from her might want to put themselves in this directory to show we can buy paints or various sort of art and crafts sort of things. And um, by that, she might get some leads in, in order to actually new customers to sell to. So I built this directory for her. And I needed to kind of get this data entry done. So this is basically filling a spreadsheet for all these names of shops I could find on the internet that didn't buy from her. The name, the URL, the phone number, the email address, and so forth, and, and fill it in. So it was really, really boring work, right? It was literally filling in a spreadsheet with a thousand, well, starting with a thousand rows of just information that you Googled, right? And I thought, I didn't want to do this job, but I thought, this would be an ideal little job to, for a little brother or sister of a friend of mine to do, right? So what I thought, I'd, I'd pay them $2 per row. It's a thousand rows. I'd give, I'd give some little kid $2,000 to go do a bit of work in their own time at home on the computer. And after four months of not being able to get anyone to do this job for $2,000, and it's not the sort of job you can put on Seek or you know, you know, take to, a, to, a, to a, a job place. It's literally just a, a little piece, bit of piecemeal work. I, I was frustrated, so I typed into Google, uh, so I think data entry online or cheap data entry, and I found this website. So this was back around 2000 and 2008. And this is a website called Get a Freelancer. And this site had been running uh, for since 2004, and it looked absolutely terrible. Uh, it was all these sort of grays. It looked like it was designed with the paint left over from the USS Midway. And it just had all this activity on it, but it just looked terrible. And it was, it was a, one of the early marketplaces in the, in the space in terms of getting freelancers to do work for you. And I went to this site, and I thought, what is this? I wasn't quite sure what was going on, but it looked like you could hire people on this site to do things. So I posted a job, I said I'll pay $2,000 to fill in this spreadsheet, and um, I posted the job, and then I went on and had lunch, and I actually completely forgot I posted the job. And I came back about three hours later, and I checked my email, and it had exploded. I had 74 emails in my inbox, and I said, what on earth is this? And I looked through it, and there was people saying, I'll do the job for $2,000, $1,500, 400 300 200 $100. I said, this is unbelievable, there's no way that someone will do this job for 100 Well, first of all, my first thought that I had was, there's no way there's 74 people want to do this job. I can't find anyone to do it. You know, I, I can't believe there's 74 people actually want to do this job. The second is, I can't believe that people will do it for as cheap as $100. Who would do that? So I looked through it, and uh, it turns out there's people from all around the world, including emerging markets and so forth. And I hired a team of people in Vietnam who did the job. They said they'll do it in three days. It cost $100. It came back. I didn't have to pay until the job was done, and the job was perfect. And I just, I just thought, this is, this is absolutely incredible to me. This is actually, like, first of all, I just couldn't believe that someone would do the job perfectly for $100. The second thing I thought to myself, this, is, this, this solves a real problem for me, right? You know, I just walked out of my last company. I was a bit of a broken man. I didn't want to kind of start a new venture just yet because I thought, gee, you know, who could I go get to work for me? All my friends I'd hired in my previous company that was kind of 
you know, they were still there. And I felt a bit embarrassed to go and ask them and say, after the, you know, the first company that hadn't really worked out, come work for my other company. But I thought, this is amazing. I can just sit at home and put my credit card into this website and I can just hire a, a whole army of people to kind of go out there and do anything. So I thought, this is great. I thought, I should build a business with this. And I thought to myself, what sort of business should I build? So I had to think about it. And I thought, actually, this sort of business is actually pretty good. This is like an eBay for jobs, right? And I thought, why hasn't eBay done something like this? This is like a marketplace where you can hire people. It's just like an eBay for jobs. Why hasn't eBay done it? And I thought to myself, surely this is a big space, right? I mean, you've got global marketplaces of products, eBay, Amazon, now you've got Alibaba. And these are large companies. These are in the, the you know, many tens or hundreds of billions of dollars market cap. I thought maybe, surely a global marketplace for services could be a, could be a big thing now. So I thought, what can I do? And I thought, okay, I've got to figure, figure out how to get going. And then I did a bit of a competitive analysis. So I said, said to myself, who else is out there in the market doing this sort of thing, right? And there were about a dozen companies, well, there were hundreds of little companies that were kind of in this space, but it was about a dozen that were kind of had some bit of traction, but not a huge amount of traction, right? So they had, you know, you know maybe 100 projects a day going through or 50 projects a day, which is not a huge amount. Anyone in this room could kind of probably get their business to, to get that sort of level, you know, 50, 50 units of sales per day, et cetera. I thought to myself, well, gee, no one's going to fund me to be number 13. So maybe I need to write, buy rather than build and maybe see if one of these 12 companies would sell to me to get going, right? And this kind of appealed to me intuitively because I just spent six years building a business that only got to about two and a half million in revenue and I was pretty tired. And let me tell you, that first million dollars in revenue that you ever make is the hardest million ever, right? So I kind of cheated a little bit to get going, right? I kind of bought a business that already had a million bucks in revenue. And so, you know, and over the history of me, of me, uh, uh, running companies uh, over time, anytime I find a website I kind of like, I just ask, I send a support ticket in and kind of say to them, you know, how much are you interested in selling this business for, just to see if they respond. Because sometimes you'd be surprised, and I'll talk about later how surprised I got with it when I looked at a few other businesses. But So I talked to this guy. This guy was living on a fish farm in, um, in Vanuatu. He was a Swedish guy. Anyway, long story cut short, but I ran around town. I signed an option agreement with him. I ran around town trying to find the money. And um, long story cut short, but... There was this person I, 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 you know, what I wanted to do is I wanted to try and build a bit of credibility in the company. And the problem was I was a sole founder, I was by myself. And being a sole founder is one of the hardest things you'll ever do because you have to get up in the morning and actually go to work and actually push yourself. When you've got two or three people, it's really a lot more easier because people are at work waiting for you to turn up and you, kind of, you push each other along. When you're one person, it's, it's, it's very, very, very tough. But um, so I thought, what can I do to get some credibility? So I thought maybe I'll try and get someone on the board of directors or advisory board and build that up. Right, so one of the things you can do if you're starting a business out from scratch is just get some people with, with some domain experience, preferably entrepreneurs who are operating and get them on the board to, to kind of come along with you uh, at, the, at the early days. So um, it turns out this guy uh, sold his business, PC Tools to Symantec, and um, his name was Simon Clausen. He's a fantastic internet entrepreneur. He's a couple of years younger than me. Uh, he sold it for $300 million. And I actually didn't click in my head how much money he'd made. I said, do you want to go on the board? And um, you know, you've, you've just sold a business in consumer internet. Maybe you can help me. And he said, sure. So long story cut short, he went on my board, I introduced him to a whole bunch of investors as we went to these meetings, and they're actually more interested in him becoming an investor in their funds than they were in my business that I was trying to, I was trying to acquire. And eventually he got, he got kind of pissed off and he said, look, I'll just give the money. So I was very lucky, it took a long time, it took about a year, uh, but eventually I got the money. So getting going. So I got the money, I bought this business, it was doing a million in revenue, it was a crappy little website, it was run out of a den uh, co-location facility in Denmark, and I walked outside and I bumped into this guy. And I, I knew this guy from many, many years ago when he, was, when he was very quite young. He was actually came back from a holiday in Europe. I think it was in Uzbekistan or something. Right? And I said, hey, I've just bought this, this business. Do you want to help me out? Um, you know, I haven't got a lot of money, but I, I think it can be a big thing. And he said, sure, I'll help you out. Pay me 20 bucks an hour. I'll help you kind of do support tickets or something or other. So there we were at the back of my house, literally with two cats uh, on the website. Um, there's Rufus with the Ajax, I don't know what he's doing with the Ajax there, but he's answering customer support tickets, and that's it. And I think, I don't know, there's probably a fair number of people in this room that are kind of at this point in their business where they're just getting it going, they've got an idea, maybe one or two of you in a room, et cetera. At that point, literally, um, the first thing I did was, which, was, which I think one of the great things about how we grew the business, not just in the early days, but all the way through, is the first thing I did was build a dashboard, right? So what I did was, I did this myself, but you know, if, you're not, if, you can't, if you can't program, you can, you can get a freelancer to do it or get your, get your programmer to do it. And literally, it was a little dashboard that showed me all the key metrics of my site 
and what happens on an hourly basis, on a daily basis, on a, on a weekly basis, a monthly basis, right? So the important things for freelancer were how many people were signing up per day, right? How many people were posting jobs per day, right? How much revenue were, were they doing per, per day, per hour, et cetera? So I had this little dashboard set up and I could measure things, right? Because once I could start measuring things, I could try changing things and see what works and what doesn't work. There's so many businesses out there just try everything and they don't measure anything. And some things will good, some things will be bad, some things will net out. You'll never know, you'll never get anywhere. And people just waste so much time just doing all these things and never measuring the results. So everything we do in this business now, we measure. But anyway, early days, I put, I, I put up this little dashboard. And the first thing I want to do is change the graphics because the graphics were rubbish, right? I want to make them a little bit more modern. So I got a friend of mine who was a designer in New York, uh, very cheaply, to um, just give me a, a, a basic skin. And I reskinned the website. And there was three contract Ukrainian programmers at the time. He said, don't do it, don't do it. We like the black and white. We like it all gray, et cetera. I imagine them, they're living in some utilitarian you know, you know, apartment building in, in some communist you know, you know, area of you know, Eastern Europe, et cetera. And anyway, I changed the graphics. And the amazing thing was that just the site looking like it was a little bit more modern, a little bit more user-friendly, instantly doubled the revenue, right? And this, you know, if you think about it, you think about there's a whole philosophy now around user experience, user, uh, user interfaces, and so forth and conversion optimization. And if you focus on that, make a site easier and easier and easier to use if you've got a website, just the increase in conversion, if you just keep grinding it out over time, that can get you eventually there to the, to the I guess, the, the, the promised land, if you just, if you just have the persistence to keep focusing on that. The other thing was that had no, no, no support people other than one contractor, Melody, who's the girl second from the left. She's in the Philippines. She was working the graveyard shift um, uh, for a few dollars per hour. Uh, she'd been with the site since about 2004. I, I told her, hire all your friends, right? Because I was really worried about support at that point. So she hired a boyfriend on the left and her other friend on the, on the, on the right. And you know, Rufus went over to the Philippines and we got going and we had a, a few, few support people kind of answering questions for half a million people. I then needed, a, I th I then needed to actually redo the logo on the site because we actually got a cease and desist letter from someone who had also had a man on a crucifix as their logo. I won't tell you who it was, um, no joke. So I thought, what better way to do that but maybe get the freelancers to come up with the idea. So I put a contest up for $10,000 to crowdsource it. I didn't realize I get 15,000 logos. So I literally was there all weekend going through the logos, trying to get the logos. And, then, and, the, and the funny thing was, we actually, I was trying to buy the domain name for the business, um, a freelancer, because my, the guy who invested my, the money in me said, you should get that domain name, freelancer.com. This is an important thing. When you think about a name for a business, you, you can pick all sorts of different names. And I kind of thought, a name is if any other name still arose. But he said, no, you should get the name freelancer.com because if someone else gets the name freelancer and you'll get a freelancer, you'll be subordinated. And this was one of the pivotal moments in the business. I didn't realize how important it would be. But um, you know, I found the guy who had the domain name. I asked him how much he wanted. He wanted three quarters of a million dollars. Now, at this point in time, I had no money, right? So I was like, well, gee, I lost you 20 grand. And he told me to go away. And I thought, gee, how would I ever get this, business, this domain name? It's impossible. I'm not going to spend quarter, three quarters of a million dollars. And I don't, I'm only doing a million a year. and I'm barely making much profit at all. But anyway, anyway, it became a running joke, and over the course of about nine months, every few days I'd say, how about $22,000? How about $24,000? He'd say, go away, don't talk to me, you're an idiot. And eventually, um, he just thought, he said, you're kind of funny, give me a phone call and we'll talk. You know, what are you trying to do? So I, I, I gave him a phone call, I talked to him, and he, I said, I'm, you know, building the site, et cetera, and he goes, okay, I'll sell it to you for a certain amount. And um, I paid, um, paid $325,000 for it, which is a huge amount of money but I didn't realize how important it was to get that great domain name for later on, right? It was actually one of the pivotal mo moments of the business. I also had to redo the logo composition when I did that, but I'll come, come back in a second. But the, the minute I actually had that name, we suddenly became a premium brand, right? Journalists would remember the name. The competitors had like these googly sort of names, these weird sort of names, right? But someone would meet in the street and say, have you heard about getting um, hiring freelancers online? You could get these things done really cheaply. People, people would not remember the name of the website, they would Google it and I would be number one, three, four, five, seven on the front page of Google for the term freelancer, right? So it was absolutely phenomenal, right? So all the SEO took off, the search engine optimization took off, which is all free traffic you get from Google if you, if you have um, uh, great um, uh, placements with your keywords. So I had you know, two cats there, they weren't very unimpressed. It was, it was kind of getting a bit full with the cats and, and, and Rufus. So we got a little office. This was in King's Cross. Uh, hired a few people very cheaply. Um, placed a few ads, we had some very junior, junior, junior engineers join us. We were literally above a nightclub. The nightclub also doubled as a strip club, which is kind of funny, because on a Friday night, um, even if you wanted to keep working after 6.30, you couldn't because the noise would vibrate the, 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 the actual um, office, uh, and you'd hear all these weird things like, uh, remember gentlemen, don't touch ladies, not even their shoes, 
So you just couldn't, you, you couldn't actually work even if you wanted to work. So I got a little sign, the graphics were still crap on the website, we had a very limited bus advertising budget. Um, you know, still pretty crappy looking website, et cetera, but we just focused on this rigorous process of what we call conversion optimization, which is like, just make the site easy to use, more friendly to use, et cetera. We, you know, the little drop down on the right hand side, select the category, post a project, the word free, these things increase the conversion, people clicking on the button. If you, might, if you test these little things, you might grind one or 2% out of your core funnel, and if you keep doing that, your revenue eventually will just keep picking up, keep picking up, keep picking up. And then this happened. I don't know how it happened, but I, I uh, entered a bunch of contests, and the, the other trick about contests is you enter a lot of contests and you start winning, you start getting nominated for more awards and more awards and more awards, and um, I don't know, for some reason they put a really ugly photo of me on the front cover of BRW, which everyone teased me about. Um, in, incessantly, and then we start winning more awards and more awards, etc. And um, you know, you just got to roll. Once you start winning awards, other people put up for other awards and so forth. And I needed a speech done for my, for the for Webbies, and you have to do a five-word speech. So I put up a thousand dollars crowdsourcing on the platform. I got two and a half thousand speeches written, which was a painful truth. Um, put a, wore a silly jacket, got a bad photo, um, <coughs> etc. By this stage, Melody had, had hired a lot of friends. So we had 170 people in this office in Manila who were doing customer support. We started doing it 24 by 7 by 365. Um, they have a lot of fun there. Every week they have like a party, like dressed like a hippie day, dressed like a whatever day. And then, then we start getting these knocks on the door from people like eBay. And all the big guys have got corporate um, development teams that will constantly just look out there for companies that are interested in the buying. So eBay approached us and said, we want to buy your company. And it wasn't really that serious. It was just kind of like a, a sort of casual sort of conversation. Uh, and I said, you better have a big check. And that's really as far as it went. But at that point, I was really worried because every time a France would sign up to our site and make some money, they'd go withdraw it and PayPal would be the only way they could withdraw their money. So all, the, all our customer information was leaking to PayPal. So I was really worried about that. I'll come back to that in a second. The office in Manila got a bit bigger over time. We moved offices in Sydney to a bit bigger place to get on the water. Had a lot of fun along the way, doing crazy things, you know, crazy engineers, won some more awards, etc. Then we got to a point where we could actually start buying some of the direct competitors. So we bought this business, this company called Scriptland. So I think it was number eight in the world at the time. Um, and this has worked out really well for us because we could actually buy these competitors for cheaper than Greenfield's marketing and just merge them in and shut them down very quickly. And the really interesting thing about buying Scriptland was get a freelancer started when someone hired someone on Script Lance to clone Script Lance. So you know how I was talking about how I was copying Get a Freelancer, using Get a Freelancer to build bid it out. Well, Get a Freelancer was cloned from Script Lance because Script Lance was earlier on. So it was kind of cool buying the company that was used to build the business that I bought. So we bought that, we bought uh, B Worker and some other competitors. We start seeing little offices around the world to do, do various things. This is the Vancouver office and the London office and so forth. My graphic design was still terrible. And no matter what I could do, I couldn't find good graphic designers in Australia. So I ran a competition on the site to find the best graphic designer out of like three million that we had on the site. And we found this cool cat from Argentina, flew him over, gave him a visa. And all of a sudden, the graphics started looking a lot better. <coughs> and let me tell you, once the graphics, your site get better and the conversion optimization gets better and the UI and the UX gets easier to use, your revenue really picks up. So I put a lot of time and effort into doing that. And we kind of got a bit frustrated. We saw Instagram sell for $1.13 billion and it had, um, you know, 13, it was 551 days old, 13 people, and it was just for putting filters on funny photos. And we thought to ourselves, we're actually changing people's lives in emerging markets by giving them a better job and helping small businesses actually get things done in the Western world. And no one really knows how big we are. So I thought maybe we'll take a little money, a little bit, raise a little bit of money from some VC. It, you know, all the VCs will, once you get any sort of scale, the VCs will call you all the time. You'll get the whole inversion of you begging for money and then people wanting to give you money will just change completely. And I thought maybe one of these guys will take a little bit of money from and um, just to put a stake in the ground to say we've raised a certain amount of money at a certain valuation. <coughs> so at that point, uh, what had happened was I had been, uh, I asked a few people that I knew in the industry what they thought about the idea. And they said, well, why don't you float it on the Australian Stock Exchange? And because you've talked about this a lot, and I've, I've written about this extensively in the papers about how I think that, the, you know, if you look at how we've built the resources industry in Australia, for those of you who don't know, the ASX is the fourth biggest equity capital market in the world. It's the fourth biggest stock market in the world. It's the same size as NASDAQ. It's just our stock market is all about mining and resources. But if you're an early stage mining company, 
you just get out there and you don't go to a venture capitalist to raise money or an angel investor. You literally just go to the stock market, you write a business plan, or what they call a prospectus, and you float your company and raise a few million dollars, even if you're very, very small. So I said, if we can redo that in technology, that'd be great. So my friend said to me, why don't you, why don't you do that? Why don't you just list it on the ASX? Because he didn't seem to be telling everyone that this, you, this is the future, you think, for, for, for financing technology businesses. So I thought, okay, I might as well put my money, money where my mouth is, and I kind of said, okay, we're well, thinking about going public. And the minute I went down that path, I mean, and you can take a company public in Australia with no revenue, you can take it public with a few million in revenue, you can take it, you know, ideally you want to have a, a, a bit of revenue, you want to have maybe two or three million dollars minimum and, and show, uh, be too confident of a strong, a strong ramp. But at this point in time, I thought, okay, fine, well, maybe we'll take it public. And the minute we started doing that, all these things happened. So this happened, so which was basically we had a um, uh, takeover offer uh, to buy the company rather than list it. We got flushed out of the woodwork, et cetera. Huge amount of publicity, huge amount of you know, recognition for the, for the business happened as a result of this. And so all the revenue picked up quite strongly from all the, the publicity. At this stage, we were doing about 18 million a year in revenue. I hired this guy on his first day, told him to write the prospectus. He was quite, uh, quite unimpressed when he, when he realized what he, was, what he was in for. And it was kind of, it was kind of fun, because at this point in time, what was happening was Twitter was going public. So they had their bird out the front of the New York Stock Exchange. And so we, um, we were trying to get our bird out the front of the ASX, and even though there were pegs on the walls, they wouldn't actually let us do it. So we, we put a neon sign in the window instead, which is uh, the next best thing. And you know, there was a huge amount of media hype, obviously. We we're going public right as um, a takeover was happening. And so we actually priced the IPO, even though takeover was at 400, we priced it at 200. So there was an insane amount of media hype going on at this, at this point in time. And um, this is kind of my Justin Bieber moment where you had like you know, literally all the cameras and the media, et cetera, there. And they told me, ring the bell, ring it hard, because the last company that floated was a little Japanese guy and he couldn't really ring the bell that hard. And it was kind of quiet. So I gave it a good ring and I broke it. And everyone went mental, and they, you know, obviously front page of the newspaper with me holding the broken bell, and you know, they said, you know, Elmer, who was the head of the stock exchange, proclaimed, this is what new technology does to old technology, and so forth. Uh, everyone went crazy. They framed it, and it now hangs up on the wall, the broken, I think it's called a donger or something. And um, in fact, there's, a now, there's now actually a, um, a thing where all new companies are list, they actually give them a broken donger. And so it started a bit of a trend. I've got one more video kind of showing you how the network grew over the years. You can cue that up and uh, play it in a second. So what you'll see here is the white dots are where our users are, the pink lines are where the employers are posting jobs, and the blue are where people are doing jobs. So early 2000s, the internet was only really in the Western economies, so it was really US Americans hiring people in Eastern Europe. Mid 2000s, you had the big BPO revolution in India, so all the internet coming in. So you know, the US to India trade really started coming, up, coming along. 2009, 10, so forth, um, Australia. In 2009, there are 8 million people on the, on the internet in the Philippines. Uh, 2010, uh, 30 million, 25 million have Facebook accounts. We floated the company here, and you can see all the recognition that happened in terms of things taking off, and right through to today, pretty much. So you can see the growth of the, of the network has been absolutely phenomenal. From, from you know, a couple of guys in a room, right to where it is today, I think one of the main things we did was really, really focus on just incrementally making the site easier to use, incrementally making it better, and, and really the whole philosophy behind what we call now growth. So you know, I encourage you that, I mean, the internet's a big place now. You can go out there and you can search for information on anything you could possibly think of. You can hear a lot of stuff from the speakers here today about marketing and sales and so forth. The other thing you should really pay attention to is the whole concept of, of conversion optimization. So that's it for me. Thank you very much.